3. The Systematics of Common Life It is commonplace in our time to stress the irrationality of man. In a very real sense, this is a valid assertion. If we view man from the perspective of some standard of reason we hold to be necessary and true, for the Christian, the humanist is irrational, whatever form his rationalism takes, modern, classical, Hindu, Buddhist, or any other form. For the modern humanist, all non-humanists, that is, all who are not modern, quote, scientific, end quote, humanists, are thoroughly irrational. Each and every one, however, is rational in terms of his basic presupposition. Man's reasonings work out the implications of his faith, so that a man's reason applies the yardstick of his faith to all things and is, in essence, a religious activity. In this sense, we must affirm that men are highly rational, but that their reasonings are warped because their religious premise is warped. All reasoning rests on a religious premise of faith with respect to reality. Moreover, because man is created in the image of God, even in his fallen estate he remains aware of the implications of that image within him. He seeks to create, however, his own principles of knowledge and order, so that fallen man remains dedicated to the principle of systematics. Although by denying the triune God, man has denied the foundations of systematics, he remains an incurable systems builder. He denies the validity of systematics to God in order to attempt to build a systematics of being. Man is a creature whose life is an outworking of his faith. In terms of that faith, man is logical and systematic in the basic thrust and direction of his life. Man lives in terms of what he believes, and his life is the logical and rational development of certain religious presuppositions. A telling illustration of the logic of the common man appears in a study by G. D. Colton. According to Colton, In modern Sicily, among the poorest classes, an executed criminal is a saint. Petre has noted that men pray, in the name of the holy gallow birds. This is perfectly logical. The crowd has seen a man publicly executed after partaking of the holy wafer, which would not be given to him unless he had just confessed and been absolved. His soul is, at that moment, unquestionably on the right side of the balance. Next moment he is launched into eternity. By all ecclesiastical logic, you are more certain of a man's final salvation after due purification purgatory than the most saintly liver whose last moments had been less convincing. Therefore, the Sicilian vulgar pray for help to the souls of the holy gallow birds. This logic may make the theologians wince, but the fact remains that the logic of these Sicilians is faultless, if their premise be granted. Thus, in Hindu thought, the religious concern is not with the relationship between man and God, but with the realisation of the nature of the self. It should not surprise us, therefore, that Hindu life is marked by a radical egoism and an unconcern for the sufferings of others. This is not because Hindus have something lacking in their makeup, but that they are logical and rational in terms of their faith. Similarly, Gautama, or Buddha, the enlightened one, called for the middle way of non-involvement in life. The resultant unconcern of Buddhism with social problems is a necessary consequence of this faith. The Jain doctrine that all matter is possessed of life leads to pacifism, vegetarianism, and non-violence, but not to love, mercy, and charity. The goal is not compassion but a disentanglement from the pain and misery of life. The activism which Mahatma Gandhi and others imported into Hindu life was borrowed from the West. It will survive and thrive 
only to the degree that Hinduism is altered and dies. The logic of common life requires a simple connection between faith and life, a systematic connection. The sophistication of intellectuals who attempt to breed hybrids do not endure. Moreover, where systematics is absent, a vacuum does not develop, another systematics replaces it. Thus, in the churches, many ministers never preach the whole counsel of God, or if they do, they do so in a wooden and inadequate manner. The result is that few people in the church are ever exposed to the Christian systematic theology. Their pastors are one text or one theme preachers, proclaiming salvation and little else, unless it be ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church. In the absence of a systematics grounded on biblical theology, most Christians function in terms of the logic and presuppositions of their humanistic and statist education. Without systematic theology, God cannot be central in the lives of ministers and members. The church cannot flourish on alien foundations, and it has not. It is not enough to proclaim adherence to the infallible words or to the five points of Calvinism. If such an adherence is not grounded on systematic theology, Without systematics, we have smorgasbord theology and religion, and it is quickly replaced by another faith because of the logic of the common life. Van Til is right. Non-indoctrinated Christians will easily fall a prey to the peddlers of Russellism, spiritualism, and all the other 57 varieties of heresies with which our country abounds. One text Christians simply have no weapons of defence against these people. They may be able to quote many scripture texts which speak, for instance, of eternal punishments, but the Russellites will be able to quote texts which, by the sound of them, and taken individually, seem to teach annihilation. The net result is, at best, a loss of spiritual power because of a loss of conviction. Many times such one-text Christians themselves fall prey to the seducer's voice. Moreover, as Van Til points out, the unity and organic character of our personality demands that we have a unified knowledge as the basis of our action. If this unified knowledge is not provided by the theologians, it will be provided by someone else. Human action requires that unified knowledge. Man's being requires a systematics, and he will either live or die in terms of it. His faith will lead him to action or inaction, to suicide or life. Thus, systematics cannot be avoided. The only question is, which systematics? Every non-biblical system has collapse built into it. It rests on false premises, leads to false conclusions, and cannot give a valid and rational interpretation of the nature and purpose of life and the world. A systematic theology derived from Scripture is widely denied today as an impossibility. The reason for this is that such deniers are concerned rather with affirming another system such as a systematic anthropology, man as creator of his own essence and lord of his own being. Such attempts, however, are a futile passion. Only a Bible-based systematics can stand and is valid 